John chapter 11 is a story that is well known within Christianity. It is a story about Jesus going and resurrecting his friend from dead. And what is interesting about this story is that I grew up in church school hearing this story very frequently. And the question, of course, was, do you believe it? If the answer was yes, then I got to be in the club. And if the answer was no, well, my impending death was not far away. And when I look at this story today and what it actually says to us now, I realize that this story has a lot to teach us about life as long as we just start with one simple assumption. The assumption is about the author, John the Apostle. And I want to invite all of you to start with this same assumption with me as we look closely at this story. I'd like for all of us to start with the assumption that John is a master storyteller. Let's assume that he knows what he's doing as he's telling us this story, because he recorded this story decades after it happened, seven decades at the earliest. And so when he goes back and he remembers this story, let's just trust that he is the Steven Spielberg of his day, because his story has lasted now for 2,000 years, which is rather impressive, isn't it? The reason I'm asking you to start with this assumption is because it allows us to trust John and lean into the metaphors, the symbolism, the beauty of this story in a way that unfolds to prove a rather profound point, in my opinion. So, with that in mind, we'll turn to John chapter 11, verse 1. We read, There was a certain man named Lazarus who was sick. He and his sisters, Mary and Martha, were from the village of Bethany. Now, Bethany was a real place at a real time with real people. Uh, if we go back about 2,000 years ago, Bethany was right here, just to the east of Jerusalem. And we find that Jesus is at the Jordan River, which is where the blue star on the map is. And it's here that Jesus is about five, six hours away if he's hustling, more likely a day's journey by the way the map is laid out. Now, the sisters then send a message to Jesus. Jesus, Rabbi, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. He said this to his disciples. This is happening for God's glory, so that God's only begotten may be glorified because of it. Well, who is God's only begotten? Jesus. He is saying, this sickness is happening for my own glory. You know what we call this? Vanity. <laughs> now, we don't like it when, when we start referring to Jesus as a, as a vain person, right? Right? But remember, we're trusting John to guide us through this story because he's a master storyteller. And if you think that I'm picking up on this just a little bit and making a big deal out of it, read what John, the master storyteller, tells us. Jesus loved these three very much, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. He loved them. John wants to know this. But then he didn't act in love. Yet even after hearing that Lazarus was sick, he remained where he was staying for two more days. John wants you to know that Jesus is living in vanity. We then read, Jesus said to his disciples, our beloved Lazarus has fallen asleep. I am going to wake to Judea to wake him. Now the disciples say, isn't it good that he's sleeping? He's trying to rest and get better. And so Jesus tells them very plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I am glad that I wasn't there so that you might come to believe. This is, once again, vanity. Imagine if you met a doctor who said, you know what, I let my patients get real sick to make sure that they know how good of a doctor I am. You know what you'd call them? Vanity, right? You wouldn't even hesitate to that. You'd say that's unethical, it's awful. Any doctor who does that would lose their license immediately. And yet John is saying, you wanna know who Jesus is? He's like those corrupt doctors in this story. Now. When we think about the metaphor and what Jesus represents in this story, we should ask ourselves, what is it that John is trying to illustrate here? And in my opinion, Jesus in this story represents something rather strange. So much confidence in one's belief about the will of God that one's religion becomes an exercise in vanity. That's what it's like, he's saying. This is who Jesus is in this story. Now, paradoxically, he also represents the Son of God which will matter here in just a few moments. And so this is what Jesus represents in this story so far. 
We then read about how Jesus arrived in Bethany. He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary stayed at home with the mourners. When she got to Jesus, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would never have died. Now we assume a confrontation is about to happen because these are confrontational words. But Martha backs off when confronted with the face of Jesus and says, yet even now, I'm sure that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus then responds by saying, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus is like, you need some more theology. So he tells her, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Those who believe in me will live even if they die. And those who are alive and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And Martha says, yes, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, God's only begotten, the one who is coming into the world. So when you think about this from John's perspective, he has this story set up where Martha says these things, responds to Jesus' teachings this way, and we have to ask ourselves, what does Martha represent in this story? Martha represents the church's idealized response to suffering and grief. In other words, if you go to the church and you say, I'm grieving the loss of my brother, and the church responds with a bunch of theology, and you say, oh, I feel so much better now, that's what the church wants you to do, right? They want to be able to explain your pain away. And when you think about the power of this, if the church was telling this story and not John, this story would go from this scene with Martha and Jesus straight to the resurrection of Lazarus, and there would be this happy end time song that would bring everything together. But the church isn't telling the story. John is telling the story. And the way John tells it is he gives you this idealized, institutional, religious response, which is, I believe you in all things, I trust you in all things, I sort of cried once, but I wiped away my tears so I didn't make any newcomers uncomfortable with my grief. So then we keep reading because John changes the story dramatically. When she had said this, Martha went back and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here and he is asking for you, she whispered. Now Mary does something else entirely after doing the exact same thing. We read, as soon as Mary heard this, she got up and went to him. When Mary got to Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, if you had been here, Lazarus never would have died. Which is the same thing her sister said just a few moments earlier. The difference is, in the next verse we read, when Jesus saw her weeping. In other words, she is saying this through tears. And Jesus sees this person weeping in front of him, and also, all of a sudden, he becomes aware of all the people around him who are weeping as well. We read that he was troubled in spirit, moved by the deepest emotions. Now, when we come from John's perspective and look at this story, we have to ask, what is it that Mary represents in this story? Mary represents the grief that does not fit into the church's tidy theological boxes. When the church tries to explain away suffering, or a Christian tries to say, you know, it's all part of God's plan, Mary says, but why does it hurt so much? And so Jesus sees her weeping, and he is deeply troubled. He is moved by the deepest emotions. And even for Jesus, grief has a way of interrupting his own plans. And so rather than giving her theology, he asks, where have you laid him? And the people around him say, come and see. And we read the shortest verse in the Bible, and Jesus wept. My friends, for me, the miracle of Mary teaching Jesus how to grieve is far more impressive than the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The reason I say this is because we talk about a God who is a humble servant that we follow in servant leadership. What greater humility is there than being willing to learn from someone else? And Jesus has this plan. It's outlined. Everything's going to go according to plan. It's the right thing. Everything's going to go according to plan. And people are going to believe in droves when they see Lazarus come out of that tomb. And yet, he gets there. And grief interrupts his plans. And he begins to weep himself. My friends, this is a story about the sanctity of grief, 
about the sacredness of tears, about the holiness of mourning. And when you look at this story, there's a story about the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And between these two markers is four days. Now, these four days, I believe, are symbolic. It could be four days, it could be four years, it could be four decades. Whatever it is, there is a time between death and resurrection. And so often religious people only think Jesus shows up on this side, on the resurrection. But this story says, no, Jesus is right here. Jesus is in the time between death and resurrection. When you grieve, you can find Christ right there. This is a story about the sanctity of grief. When you look closely at what happens next, there is a crowd around. They see Jesus weeping, and there is wisdom in this crowd. The wisdom of the crowd comes forward and says, see how much he loved him. And when they say that, they are acknowledging what we do when we grieve or why we grieve. After all, there are lots of people dying right now. And the only way we function is the fact that we grieve those who we love, those who we know, those who we can put a face to the name. And so when they tell us this, we read these words and we realize that you do not need to feel ashamed of the grief you carry with you because Christ is in the middle of that and in the middle of that is love. Because if you grieve the loss of someone, it's because you love them. And when you go to a funeral and you cry, the reason why is because you love the person who you have lost. Now, shortly thereafter, the crowd says something else that is pretty profound as well. They look around and they say, why is Jesus crying? This is the guy who opened the eyes of the blind. Couldn't he have done something for Lazarus? It's almost like they are the logical people in the room. And when you think about what this story is telling, and especially the fact that John includes that question, you realize that what they are saying is that Jesus had this plan of going and raising Lazarus from the dead, and then it got interrupted by grief. And while Jesus had to go there and say, you know, I can convince these people and get things right, it all of a sudden got interrupted and he realized there was a different priority that he had to live by. In other words, if you have a desire to help others believe it always takes a backseat to empathy as a follower of Christ. Every time. And I have found that a lot of people, specifically Christians, when it comes to funerals, they want so desperately to say the right thing, so they say things like, hey, it's all part of God's plan. What I have found is that when they say that, they are often making themselves comfortable with the grief they are seeing in the person in front of them. And when I see that and it unfolds, we have to remind ourselves, it's not, it's not the most important thing to hold our theology together at all times. It's much more important to practice empathy in the time between. Additionally, when we think about this story being about the sanctity of grief, it teaches us one other thing, which is there are few gifts greater than another being present with you in your grief. There are few things that are a more extravagant gift than people giving their time and being willing to sit right next to you as you weep. I point this out because when we look at how we act when we are grieving, we often tell people when we are crying, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm sorry, as you try to wipe away tears. That message is, I am inconveniencing you, I am sorry, I'm trying to hold it together, this grief really isn't that important, there's other things we have to get to. I think a much better way to approach grief is rather than apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, is instead to say, thank you for sitting with me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hearing me out. When we talk about the sanctity of grief, there is a deep reverence and respect that we have to hold when it comes to our process of grieving because our society doesn't give many spaces for us to grieve. Our, our, our whole family systems, our whole structures, everything we encounter doesn't really handle our grief very well. And yet we have this story that teaches us that Christ is found in the middle of our tears. Now, about 2,000 years after this story, I came across another story that also talks about the sanctity of grief. And it reminded me so much of John 11 that I wanted to share it with you this morning. This is from a blog on the internet called Rockstar Ronin. 
and it begins all the way back in August 13 of 2010. Now the mom, Maya Thompson, she started this blog when she found out that her son had an illness. We read on the blog, as I was taking the boy's Christmas card picture, I noticed Ronan's left eye looked a little off. Ronan had been diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma, a rare but most common childhood cancer. We know we are going to beat this. Day one of this journey begins with all kinds of confidence, this assuredness that everything will work out. And after this, we read blog post after blog post. You can see how many days have different blog posts. She's blogging every day, updating people about Ronan's journey. And he becomes more and more entwined with the hospital system and more and more care continues to grow. And yet she celebrates things along the way, like in October 31 when we read, Ro was able to trick or treat in everything. But then a few months later, things took a turn for the worse. And in February, she writes, Dear Cancer, I will never love you. You will never be my friend. You've taken my beautiful life and ripped it into shreds. And then just three months later, in May of 2011, Ronan passed away. And she wrote this blog post about it. Where is Ronan? This is what I asked my husband, and he just starts to cry. Then I remember, Ronan is gone. In her grief, she writes this, the day of her son's death. If you see me, please don't be afraid to come up and tell me hello and hug me. Please don't be afraid to tell me how sorry you are because of the pain you know we are all in. But please do not tell me things like God has a bigger plan for Ronan, how he belongs in heaven, how he is happy with God now, because all of those things just piss me off and I will punch you. <laughs> she wrote to them, this will never make sense to me. And as I know, our family did not deserve any of this pain, especially not Ronan. Well, it's here that you would assume that the blog ends with this tragic note of Ronan's death. And you think about the weight that Maya Thompson had on her as a mother who had to say goodbye to her son, and it's one of the worst things a human being can experience in this life. But the next day, she posted about her journey through grief. And the next day, and the next day, the language is quite colorful, as you would expect for someone who's gone through the worst that humanity has to offer. And as the blogs pile up week after week after week, she's blogging every day talking about her journey through grief, you come across this post that happens in October of 2011 when she says that her and several other families were invited to a Taylor Swift concert as some sort of like, hey, we're sorry this happened, can we make it up to you in any way? And it's an outreach from the city. And so she was invited to this Taylor Swift concert. She didn't think much of it. And the way that she tells the story, Maya Thompson, is she says that she was sitting backstage with these other families, and I heard this girl come walking in saying, Maya, 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 Maya. And she turned around, and it was Taylor Swift. And she was like, how do you know my name? And she found out that Taylor Swift had been reading her blog on grief, and that she had specifically asked that Maya Thompson and her family showed up to this concert. Now. Maya Thompson didn't know what to say, as I don't think I would either. And there she was, trying to talk to Taylor Swift, and she processing this whole thing that Taylor had like listened to her blog, read her blog, and been through this whole journey with her. And so the next night, Taylor Swift invited her back, and she dedicated a song to Ronan and her family, and she said it was just one of the most moving experiences. And she thought that was the end of it. So she kept blogging about her grief, for another year, almost every day for another year, a year and a half after Ronan's passing. When, in September of 2012, Maya Thompson wrote another blog, and she says that she got a voicemail on her phone, she opened it, and the phone began to say, hi, this is Taylor Swift, I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> and she goes in the voicemail to say, I wrote a song for Ronan, I'm singing for a fundraiser on Stand Up to Cancer, and I'd like to sing this song. Oh, the song is actually composed of your words from your blog, and I put it to music, and I'd like to credit you as a co-songwriter with me. And so, five days later, there was Taylor Swift on national TV singing about Ronan Thompson. And she took words from Maya Thompson's blog, which said, like, I remember your bare feet down the hallway, I love you to the moon and back, you were my best 
four years. And she wrote about this, Maya Thompson wrote about this in her blog. She said, this is by far the most amazing thing that I could ever have imagined, times a billion. And you'd think, this is the end of the story, right? What a beautiful thing. All of a sudden, this mother who's gone through so much has some joy in her life again. But yet, Maya Thompson keeps on blogging about her journey with grief. And as the blogs go on, it starts getting more sporadic. It was every day, then it becomes every week, then every other week, then every month. And in the once a month blogging time, about five years after Ronan's passing, right before his birthday, she wrote another post where she said, I'm forever sorry and heartbroken that you were not here to turn nine with us. And of course she would write that, right? On her son's ninth birthday, and what's interesting is after this, she started writing less than once a month, and she went a long ways from August 2017 to May 2021 without writing any blog. And the reason she started writing in 2021 again was because it was the 10-year anniversary of Ronan's passing. I point all of this out because it teaches us a lot about the sanctity of grief. And the best way I have come across to understand the sanctity of grief is an illustration. I can't find who created it. I looked everywhere on the internet, but it has helped me immensely. It's called the ball, the box, and the button. So imagine your life as a box, and in the box is a button that is activating your pain that you feel when, you come, when it comes to grief. And then inside that box is also a ball that bounces around as you go through your whole life. So imagine the loss that you've gone through, right? The first time you go to the grocery store, without your loved one is gonna bring up some memories, right? And so the ball bounces around and hits that pain button and you go to the grocery store and all of a sudden you're weeping in the aisle between bread, right? <laughs> and yet, as time goes on, what we assume happens is that the pain button gets smaller or the pain gets less intense. But that's not true, is it? What happens is the ball gets smaller as time goes on and there are less things that hit that pain button, but man, when it hits like a 10 year anniversary, oh, does it hit. When you encounter something that you never thought was connected to this person that you lost, oh, it hits that button and it's just as intense. And so we come across this 10 year anniversary, Maya Thompson's ball has gotten much smaller, and yet she gets there and the day before she said she cried all day thinking about Ronan. And she wrote these words to Rona. She said, you left me behind, and on most days, I am okay. I have learned to carry this grief and carry it well. And on the days where I cannot, like yesterday, I give in to this pain. I let myself weep for your touch, for your voice, your mischievous laugh, and your smothering kisses. My grief is a testament to my love for you. My grief is my superpower. Thank you to all of you who have checked in on us. Thank you for acknowledging the loss of Ronan, and thank you for forever carrying him in your hearts. Your words and your endless support means everything to me. It's one of the reasons that I will not get through only today, but I will continue to get through this life. I love you, Ro. I miss you. I love you. And I hope you are safe. And she posted this picture. When I read this story, I am moved to tears at how much she has brought us along on this journey of grief. And when I read this story today, Maya Thompson reminds me of Mary of Bethany. She has shown us what it looks like to actually grieve, even though we have in our minds that people get over things, don't we? And yet what she tells us is, if we ask people to get over the passing of her son, we are basically asking her to let go of the love that she held for him once. And so Maya Thompson is Mary of Bethany, and if that's the case, then her grief, just like Mary's grief, is holy. And if that's true, then the grief that you hold with you this morning, your grief is holy as well. Your grief and what you understand and weep and don't have answers for, that is just as holy as Mary of Bethany and Maya Thompson, it is worth exploring, opening up, sharing with others, and also listening to others because we believe in the sanctity of grief. My friends, may we become better at creating spaces for us to grieve. 
May you personally and generously give your time to sit with another in their tears. And may you always love those whom you have lost, and may you let go of any shame you feel for your tears, and instead hold a deep reverence for the grief you carry. Amen.